Hi, and thank you very much for taking some time out of your busy day to watch this video today. If you have an app or you work on an app that can benefit from fast storage, then this talk is definitely for you, as I'll be covering storage class memory. My name is Tobias Klima. I'm a program manager in the Windows Storage and File Systems team. And my goal for the next 15, maybe 20 minutes, is to give you an overview of A, what storage class memory is, how it's supported in Windows, and lastly, how your app can get the most out of this new exciting technology. Let's look at how you can actually use storage class memory. In another talk, I've described how it's exposed in two ways in Windows Server. You have a block interface, which looks exactly like disk devices today, be it hard drives or SSDs, and it can be used in exactly the same way. But because storage class memory can also be used in a byte addressable way, we expose that possibility to your apps as well. Now, backing up a moment, what is storage class memory? We define it as a persistent store, so something that doesn't lose its contents when power goes out, that sits directly on the memory bus. And because of this, it can be byte addressable. Now, let's look at the opportunity of this. We have a block interface that we provide you with in Server 16, and you can use it without any app changes. But you still go through the entire software stack that that brings with it. Now, what if you could get that software stack out of the way? That is the opportunity. We further reduce latency by providing your app with direct access to the hardware. And we do this by essentially just, again, reusing infrastructure we already have in Windows through memory map files. So, and I'll go into the detail a little bit later, but on a DAX volume, a direct access volume, you can use memory mapping in your app to get direct access to the hardware. Just a quick overview of the architecture. And I know this is a busy slide, so don't get completely hung up on the diagram here. But once you have storage class memory in your system, the administrator can decide what kind of volume he wants to configure. And if he decides to configure one of these new DAX volumes, then the memory mapping that I'm talking about here really comes into effect. What we're really doing underneath is we're in the past, if you used memory map files on SSDs or hard drives, would grab whatever file you're mapping, bring it into memory, into a virtual address space, and that's where your application would then modify the file and its contents. And when it was done, bring it all back down to disk. That's how it used to work. How it works on storage class memory is slightly different. Because it already sits on the memory bus, we don't have to move it anywhere. Your data structures, your files are already there. So all we do when you memory map that file is we create the mapping for you, and you're off to the races to make adjustments to it. That is how we get extremely low latency, which you'll see in a little bit. The app modifies directly its data. There is no paging. There is no queuing, none of that. You have direct access. The cool thing is that you get true device performance with this. And because NVDMN is based on DDR memory, that means you essentially get DDR memory speeds as well. Now, there's an impact to this because, of course, there is no such thing as a free lunch. While we can give you extreme performance with this, be aware that filter drivers that exist in the storage stack today may not work properly. So there are filters, encryption, antivirus, um, replication that may be looking at IOs coming by that apps generate to do their work. Now, if we expose a virtual address space to you and you just operate on that, there is never any I.O. created going down the stack. You're really running with your app in this mode, the very right-hand side of this diagram. You're just doing memory operations, and I.O. is never generated. The nice thing is that we were actually able to take a closer look at this and find that Windows Defender, for example, or antivirus filters in general don't rely on this. What they really need to know is, when was a file modified? So all they have to do is look for the close on the file. And when there is a close, they can just assume this file was modified. Let me go scan it and make sure nothing bad happened to it. So those will still work. Now, how do you use DAX volumes? Good question. Again, I said at format time, when the volume is created, you can decide if it's a DAX volume or not. Either it's a regular NTS, NTFS volume, or you make it DAX. How do you do that? Two options. Either you go through format.com, which has been in the command prompt for a very long time, and there is a new DAC switch for you. Here's an example. Or you go through PowerShell, also a good management tool, 
And we added, again, a DAX switch in the format volume commandlet. That's how you set this up. Now, say your app is running on a system, and you need to figure out if there is DAX access or not. Perfectly valid, and we can't have you guessing. So your app can query either based on the volume handle or based on the file handle if that file is on a DAX volume or if that volume itself is a DAX volume. And again, we reuse what we already have in Windows with get volume information or get volume information by handle. And by the presence of the file DAX volume flag that I'm showing here, your app can deterministically figure out, is this a DAX volume with these cool capabilities, or is it a regular volume? Now, memory mapping. In the past, it's been recommended not to use it because, well, you might have consistency issues if power is lost. You would have to either flush all the time, or you need to be very, very confident that you don't have a power loss. That is changing with storage class memory because it is natively persistent. So I'll provide you with a little reference to how to find out more about memory mapping in the last slide. But just here right now, this is how you do it. You create a file just like you have in the past on your DAX volume, on your NTFS volume. Nothing changes there. What you do next is you call create file mapping. This basically just grabs an object that you can operate on later. Then you call map view of file, which makes sure that, again, in the past, this would have grabbed that portion of the file and put it into memory. Whereas here, the difference is we just map the ranges directly to the storage device. And now you're good to go. You could do loads, you can do stores, mem copies, whatever you want to do to update your data structures. And that is the right hand path I showed in that diagram. It's very, very, very fast. And then, in general, what you would do is call flush view of file when you're done with your updates to make sure that all the data you updated, if it's not already on the device, makes it through all the CPU caches, L3, L2, L1, and out to the device. The nice thing with NVDIMM-N is, is that it relies on a hardware capability that power protects the memory controller. Why does it matter? It matters because there are instructions in Windows called non-temporal memory instructions that you can use to do the same work. And what it allows you to do is to skip that flush altogether, which can be expensive. The non-temporal -mem memory instructions ensure that whatever data you're writing goes through all the, or rather, past all the CPU caches and directly into the memory controller. And since that one is protected, you're good to go. And for NVDMN, we'd really recommend using non-temporal instructions, because it can be faster than using normal load stores. Now, Backing up, why is this so interesting? The interest comes out of, one, the speed you gain, and two, the efficiency gains you can get. It's really not true anymore that storage is slow. Hard drives, 15 millisecond seek latencies. Normal SSDs, 500 microseconds. Sounds fast, but if you're thinking of how long a clock cycle takes, it really isn't that fast at all. PCIe attached SSDs. 50 to 100 uh, microseconds, which is good, but still too long to avoid context switches. You still need asynchronous I.O. for those. NVDIM, not so much. We're looking at, in block mode, um, latencies of about 5, maybe 7 microseconds. And in this, I'll show you the latencies and the performance in just a moment. But the key here is that all the storage we've written in the past to get around the fact that storage was slow, or I should say the software we've written in the past, is actually getting into the way now. So we've done caching. We've done queuing of IOs. We use asynchronous IO, which really just means, oh, yeah, let me do this IO. And by the way, CPU, please let me know when it's done, and I can come back from what I was doing before. That it's all overhead at this point. Why not just do the IO because the storage is so fast, especially if it's NVDMN and based on DDR memory? So direct access is the way to do this. And I've mentioned this already. It's decided at format time whether or not your volume will be in direct access mode or not. The cool thing is that if you think about this, as I mentioned, why do you need the context switch? Avoid it. You want to make an update to that memory map view? Make the update. Just do it synchronously and be done with it. And you save thousands of CPU cycles in the process, which means your app can run faster. How fast? Mm, let's have a look at that. And the hardware we're running on actually was provided by HP Enterprises. So I have a very, very simple demo here, actually. 
what we're doing is a simple 4K random write test. I'm just doing 4K random write updates on a one gigabyte file. The first test runs against an NVMe SSD. This is the fla fastest flash we can get our hands on at the moment. And a latency of 0.0, .0 milliseconds is what we see here, and about 56 megabytes per second in throughput, which is nice. Now let's run the same thing against the NVDIMM, but it's not in a byte addressable mode yet. What we're doing here is the same 4K sector updates to a NVDIMM in what we call block mode. We have software emulation on top that makes it look like a disk. And this is already great. We're already 10 times faster. And what I mean by that is 10 times faster than the fastest SSDs we can get our hands on today. We're moving about, what, 580 megabytes per second? And the latency dropped down from 70 microseconds to about 10 microseconds. Now, let's run the same workload again, but this time against an NVDIMM with that memory mapping path that I've been talking about in this video. What we're really just doing is mem copies directly into these memory ranges. And you get an idea here of how fast it is. We're, again, not quite 10 times faster, but a lot faster, about eight times. We're now moving f over four gigabytes per second. And the latency in milliseconds doesn't even show up here because our counter doesn't have high enough resolution. So take a look at the summary at the bottom. We moved from 66 or 66,000 nanoseconds for the NVMe SSD to about 6,000 nanoseconds for the block mode NVDIMM to just 800 nanoseconds to do a given, an average 4K random update on that memory map file. Think about what your app could do with this kind of speed and performance. And this is persistent. If power goes out, this data is not lost. So from here, we can skip the backup video, luckily. I've talked about flushing, about memory instructions, about L3, L2, L1 caches, memory controllers. And a lot of app developers out there, I'm sure, do not want to deal with any of this. And I can understand that. Now, there are some that say, hey, this is cool, and I have to deal with this today anywhere, in any way, in my high-end enterprise apps. But there will be a lot of you out there that say, isn't there a way around this to make this easier? The answer is yes. And that answer is NVML, which stands for Non-Volatile Memory Library. It's a project maintained on GitHub. So you can go to pmem.io and find out more about it. And right now, it's working on Linux. Now, we are hard at work to port the same library to Windows as well and make it available to you guys. And what it provides you with is essentially a tool set. It gives you an, the ability to create a persistent memory-aware log structure, a persistent memory-aware heap, whatever you might want. You need help with flushing because you don't feel like figuring out what the latest best flush instruction on a Broadwell CPU is? Great. Use NVML, and it can help you with all of these things to much more easily adopt storage class memory and its significant performance gains in your apps. Now, in closing, a few resources for you. So technical resources here on memory mapping APIs. I was actually surprised when I looked this up. Those APIs haven't changed since 1993 when that article on MSDN was authored, which I think is amazing that we can reuse it. Secondly, information on get volume information for your apps to figure out how, if they're actually running on a DAX volume or not. And then lastly, I know that this means app changes, which is not an easy thing to ask for. But think about how memory mapping on NVDIMM devices could be used by your apps to significant effect, just given the latencies you've seen here today and the throughput you can achieve. Do you have data structures that your apps rely on that need to be updated very, very quickly? Great candidate for this. So thanks for spending the time and watching the video. Have a good evening.